Yes, the Second World War, or the end of the Second World War, and London lays in ruins. And this really is where our story starts. Hi there, my name's Richard Blackshire, and I'm currently the archivist for Long Dean School, and I'm also a past pupil. In this video presentation, we're going to look at the history surrounding the Long Dean School of Hemel Hempstead, how it came about. And for us to do that, we need to go way, way back in time to just after the end of the Second World War. When dramatic changes were made to the layout of Hemel Hempstead and it became a new town or one of the new towns. And within the area of Bennett's End, two schools were constructed, a secondary modern and a grammar school. And these two schools ultimately became what we know today as Long Dean School. We're going to chat to some past students as well, some from the 1950s and some from the 1960s, to see what their experience of schooling was like way, way back then. And you can make your own mind up from hearing their tales as to whether the education system has improved or not. So let's do that now. Let's go back in time and understand how Hemel Hempstead came about or the new town of Hemel Hempstead came about. And then we'll look at the two schools that were constructed in the 1950s. On 4th of February 1947, the government purchased 5,910 acres of land with the aim of creating a new town surrounding the small town of Hemel Hempstead. Back then, Hemel Hempstead was quite small, approximately 20,000 residents. This town was to be the third candidate town for redevelopment and the decentralisation of people and industry from London was to take place very quickly. Work began on the new town of Hemel Hempstead in 1949, just four years after the end of the Second World War. Apart from the development of a new town centre called the Marlows. Two other areas were designated for the development of council housing or social housing as we call it today. These two new areas were called Adifield and Bennett's End. Both Adifield and Bennett's End had their own set of shops and community centres. Bennett's End was to be located on the rising ground to the southeast and had its own set of shops called Bennett's Gate. Construction on Bennett's End began in 1951 and 300 houses were occupied by autumn 1952. It must have felt like paradise for those coming from London to live then in a, this new clean environment. Everything was new. Houses, shops, roads, factories, hospitals and of course schools. There was a great sense within Hemel Hempstead then of pride in the environment. Everyone looked after their houses and gardens and generally the town felt like a very happy place to live. Within Bennett's End, two schools were built for secondary education. One school, a grammar school, was to be called Apsley Grammar, and the other school, a secondary modern, was to be called Bennett's End Secondary Modern. Both schools were opened in September 1955. 
The build of these two schools used the very latest types of material and design for their construction. So modern were these schools at the time that architects from all over the UK came to look at the building's construction. They were quite unique at that time. For us to understand why two new schools were opened right next to each other in Bennett's End, we need to first understand how the education system worked in those days. The 11 plus examination. Introduced in 1944, the examination was used to determine which type of school a student should attend after primary education. A grammar school, a secondary modern school or a technical school. When the system was implemented, technical schools were not available on the scale envisaged. Therefore, this was left to two very different types of school. The 11 plus was undertaken during the last year of primary school education and tested a student in basic mathematics, general English, comprehension and general knowledge. Depending on the result of the 11 plus determined the skill a student had and it was felt that different skills required a different type of schooling. As such, the 11 plus took on a particular significance. Rather than allocating according to the need or ability of a child, it became seen as a question of passing or failing. This led to the exam becoming widely resented by some, although strongly supported by others. Poor results in the 11 plus usually meant that you would be destined for secondary modern education. For boys, this meant learning traditional handicraft subjects which would suit a tradesman job in the outside world. For girls, the education was geared towards becoming a good housewife, learning to cook, sew and clean, or working in an office as administration staff. For those destined for a grammar school, whatever sex you were, it was hoped that you would be destined primarily for management in the workplace. The education here would be heavily biased towards academic achievement and could well be the stepping stone towards university. Whilst these two types of school existed and in the main achieved their goal as far as sending students off along separate pathways, the story isn't quite as clear cut as it might seem. It's only after that generation from the 1950s and 60s progressed through their working life and now able to answer how education had influenced their own achievements in life can we establish if the two school approach to secondary education works. From what I have seen from my own progression through life and that of many of my fellow friends from school from that time, it's quite nice to know that pigeonholing students one way or the other did not specifically hold anyone back at all. There certainly have been many overachievements from those schools at Secondary Modern and underachievements from the grammar school. The two heads. Of course, the two schools required two headmasters, what we call today head teachers. The grammar school was appointed Mr. Valentine Wrigley, and Bennett's End Secondary Modern was appointed Mr. Cyril Fowler. These two gentlemen had very different backgrounds, but their attitude to teaching was quite similar. Mr. Wrigley was a Yorkshireman, attending Queen's College, Oxford and gaining a degree in history. 
Prior to arriving at Apsley Grammar School, Wrigley taught at two public schools and during the Second World War he worked in the Intelligence Corps in North Africa and later became a military government officer in Italy. Mr Fowler came from Sheffield. His parents were heavily involved in the Methodist Church. Fowler attended Nottingham University and gained a second in the College of Preceptors examinations. His qualification was the equivalent to a Bachelor of Arts. After the Second World War, Cyril Fowler had positions at two primary schools and a secondary school in the Nottingham area. In 1955, Cyril left Players Secondary School to become headmaster at the new Bennetsend Secondary Modern in Hemel Hempstead. Whilst it's easy to understand the origins of a Bennetsend Secondary Modern School, because it's located in the Bennetsend area and has the badge of the Tudor Rose and the motto Faith, Effort and Loyalty, it's much more difficult to understand where the name Apsley Grammar School comes from. Most people think that, of course, there's a connection with the village of Apsley as part of Hemel Hempstead. Although there is no real evidence to support the school being named Apsley Grammar School after the village of Apsley, there is a slight hint within the journal that VJ Wrigley kept as head of Apsley Grammar School. He talks on the first day of school in 1955 about the badge, and this is what he says. Badge. A red demi-lion chosen because Apsley House was the home of the Duke of Wellington, whose crest was a red demi-lion rampant bearing a banner with the cross of St George. So, maybe Apsley refers to Apsley House in London, where the Duke of Wellington resided. So it's very difficult, as I said, that we don't understand fully who made that decision as to what the school might be called. Of course, the rampant Red Lion disappeared as soon as Longdean School came about. The amalgamation of the two schools meant a change of the badge itself. And so we do still retain a lion, rampant, but the colour has changed to silver. So this denotes a part of the Bennett's End Secondary Modern School, whose colours were silver and blue. And so that's why the badge is as it is today. We're now going to talk to some past students from the 50s and 60s and learn about their first day at secondary school. Some of them are from Apsley Grammar School and some of them are from Bennett's End. Do I recollect my first day at school? Yes, I, I certainly do and like a lot of other people I think um, that sticks firmly in my mind. My father walked me to the gates and then that was it, I was on my own. The main issue for me that day was that I had decided to go to secondary school with short trousers on. And of course, when I got there and got into the playground, all the other kids were in long trousers. That caused me some issues. Yeah, hi. Uh, just recall that, uh, you know, turning up with uh, friends and sort of being herded in at the playground and just the vastness of the school, the number of people and the rest of it and being taken on into the school hall. Um, I've just never seen so many people in one hall and uh, definitely memories of Mr Fowler blowing about like Batman in his cape. Um, I can remember my first day quite clearly. Um, I lived in Leverstock Green at the time, so we walked down Peascroft Road and came into the school by the bike sheds. We were corralled into the uh, 
playgrounds and then various teachers shouted out names and we were sent to our classrooms. I think one of my first impressions was it, that after being at primary school it was so large and we never thought we were going to find our way around. I remember the, I remember the preparation for it. I remember for the clothes. We, we'd been given instructions as to the clothes had to have my name inserted onto shirts, everything jackets and we all had to wear a uniform um, I mean I say that I do remember the headmaster saying that we were I mean which I find now bizarre but we were a selected group of people to be very lucky to be at that school and not to forget that um, which I thought was very I mean at that age at the age of 11 I thought I was, you know, it made me very bouncy and thought, yeah, great. Obviously on reflection, you, you question some of these things. But yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting first day. Well, first day at school, at Apsley Grammar School. Um, I can remember cycling there in September 1956 in trepidation, really, wondering what to expect. Um, in my new school uniform, uh, new satchel and um, various other things in, contained within it, for example a, a box full of uh, mathematical instruments I recall. Um, when I got there uh, we were ushered into the cycle sheds by senior pupils and then uh, ushered through to this school itself where we were apportioned into our classes and uh, I went into the classroom for the first time to be met by Miss Milbank, the history teacher who was to be our new form teacher. Yeah, I certainly do. I remember we had to wear the exact school uniform that was um, listed out um, before we started. So it was uh, the grey skirt, had to be certain pleats, certain skirt lengths. Remember it had to be yeah. a couple of inches below the knee or something. That soon changed though, didn't it? Yeah, we used to it roll is. it up at the waistband. Mm. Juliet cap. Mm. Um, the black lace-up socks, the, uh, no, the grey black lace-up shoes and the grey socks. Mm. Um, and we had to, um, and they tie as well, remember that? Yeah. Um, and carry in heavy bags, because in those days you, you weren't given uh, an idea what the timetable was going to be on the, um, the first day. And we had three lots of PE kit uh, for hockey, gym, cross country, and I think I remember taking every single piece of PE kit, could hardly walk up barn acres. <laughs> As always in these first days of school, it was a lovely warm summer's day. If you didn't want to go to the school, then you would have much, been, much rather been uh, playing. However, off to school I went with my then best friend David Hyde. Uh, and for the only time in my life uh, in secondary school, I had a, had a cap. Having got there, I discovered nobody else was wearing that was discarded and never worn again. Um, we rocked up. There was no, in those days, there was no familiarisation day, so it was actually the first time I actually stepped foot in the school. The sun was shining, there was a warm breeze blowing through the classroom, so the windows were open and we had the radio on and there was a news flash that the, uh, the triple police murderer Harry Roberts had been uh, caught and uh, he actually was in prison for about 48 years. Uh, but that, that, that happened that day. It's probably fair to acknowledge here that not much has changed for students on their first day at school. Looking back at the Head's diary entries for the mid-50s through to the 60s, it seems the first morning was always taken up with familiarity of the school. Then after a break time mid-morning, students constructed their timetables within an exercise book. Then after lunch break, three periods of lessons started. Thereafter, a school day started with an assembly with the heads conducting some form of address to the whole school. This address each day always included prayers. Assembly was then followed by four periods of 40 minute lesson time spanning the whole morning where different subjects could be taught. There was a mid-morning break of 15 minutes where a tuck shop was available that sold crisps and chocolate. Lunchtime was followed with three periods of subject lessons till the end of school. 
So the school's starting time was nine o'clock with the morning ending approximately at 12 o'clock. Lunch was from 12 till 1.30 and the afternoon resumed at 1.30 and finished at 3.45. To follow on from the recollections of a first day at school from our past students, let's now hear what they have to say about the teaching staff back in the 1950s and 60s. Teachers, interesting bunch of people, some of them some of them really good and some of them I think had personality disorders on reflection not at the time but at, at that time some of them were incredibly strict and I've got memories of being in a classroom with a teacher that would if you weren't paying attention would throw the blackboard rubber and I'm talking about a block of wood and if it would hit you I mean it could knock you out and through his anger he would throw it um, to one of the children and then it would land not necessarily on his head but it would hit him and then I have other memories of a, of a child being told to sit by on the floor like a dog because he wasn't he was misbehaving and he was I mean today it would be perceived as um, abuse to be honest with you and then there were lovely teachers, there were great teachers that were entertaining, they were fun, they made learning enjoyable. Um, but it was a real varied bunch. Um, and it's the same thing, on reflection, some of them should never have been teachers. Regarding the teachers at Apsley Grammar School, they were a formidable lot. Uh, approximately an equal number of the sexes, male and female. Clothed in academic gowns, uh, we always stood up when they walked into the room. Um, they were really quite a well-educated lot. I mean, there was a very big representation of Oxbridge there, plus prominent uh, provincial universities. Um, although some were the butt of criticism and mirth, overall, I think we were all very indebted, particularly when one got to the sixth form. They provided many useful insights into difficult subjects and uh, I feel forever grateful to them. What were the teachers like? Well, a mixed bag really. Most of these teachers, I think we have to remember that most of these teachers had probably either done national service or had actually fought in the Second World War. They had come into schools with a kind of military background, if you like, um, certainly it was, as I said, a mixed bag. Other teachers, yep, they commanded a certain amount of discipline just by kind of shouting really sometimes, but uh, the better ones didn't need to do that. Um, and I think the kids respected the better, better teachers and we got through certain subjects quite, quite easy that way, or easier that way. Well, like life, there was good and bad. Um, there were some teachers which were obviously uh, really interested in the children and their pro progression through through learning. Others, um, they took some took an instant delight to you, and that's something you had to put up with. Um, all in all, I think most of the teachers I had were okay. I had one or two which obviously didn't like me, and I didn't particularly like them, and we just really got on with it just you know I accepted that that's that's what happens but all in all I think most of the teachers were okay I mean I recall one particular one we always called him Ash who used to teach uh, um, science and he was forever making a mistake and said oh I made a hash of that it wasn't until after I left school left school that actually sussed him uh, uh, and in fact he did it on purpose it was the way of making you go through the experiment and be better than he was excellent method of teaching with hindsight, didn't understand it at the time. But in general, there were some very, very nice teachers and there were some other really strange ones, and I won't name names. Um, yeah, I started Epsi Grammar in 67, and my form teacher in 1X was Mr. Frenou, who was very strict, <laughs> and due to him, can still remember and can still recite the form register. And the girls were Adams, Aris, Cutler, Eames, Evans, Francis, Jarrett, Keane, Hedda, Pepler, Richard Steptoe, Stockley, Stuart Smith, Sutcliffe, White, Wimpress. 
and the boys <coughs> was Boniface Brown, Indians, Johnson, <laughs> Leach, Logie, McCourt, Mitchell, Montgomery, Outerside, Sagas, Sharp, Stedman, Stewart, Townley, Williams. Wow! I would never have <laughs> the boys. <laughs> you accepted that what they did and what they taught you. In hindsight, I suspect they probably weren't as uh, brilliant as many of the teachers are today. Um, I had to chat with my brother about this when in preparation for this. He actually started at Longdean in the very first year and he observed from his members that the teachers he had from the old Apsley Grammar School uh, academically and far better than those we had had at Bennett's End, which is not really surprising but possibly harsh. Now if we had better teachers perhaps we might have become more studious students and we'd done better, it would be more successful but who knows, you just accept what you've got. As the population grew within Hemel Hempstead, the numbers increased at both schools. For Bennett's End, this was more of an issue, as the pass mark for the 11 plus was around 80%. The numbers attending the grammar school could easily be accommodated. But within Bennett's End, the story was very, very different. The school was rapidly running out of room. In 1955, when both schools were open for the first time, Bennett's End had just 212 children attending and Apsley Grammar School had a mere 125. At this point, not all form years were being filled. 1956 saw a sharp increase in teaching staff at Bennett's End. 18 more staff were recruited and in 1957, a further 12 staff were added. The lack of space in 1957 at Bennett's End meant that 21 forms were being overcrowded and also had no form room to attend a register. Therefore, three dining room areas were set aside for form classrooms at that time. In 1958, Bennett's End School had 834 students, a sharp increase, and in 1959 saw the inclusion of three fifth forms for the first time. By 1960, Bennett's End had 903 pupils, but at this point, the planning, inclusion and build of temporary classrooms had been agreed. Additional classrooms had been promised since 1958, but erected in 1961. Each annex, as they were called at that time, accommodated two separate classrooms, their own boiler for heating, and a central reception area for hats and coats. Two sets of annex were erected towards the boundary with Apsley Grammar School, and you can see on this short video clip where those two annexes were situated. Three further annex buildings were erected on the pathway towards the Hill Common entrance. In all, 10 additional classrooms were available through these annex buildings. This took some pressure from the school and classroom sizes went back to a more normal size. But still, the school was much larger than it was initially envisaged. Let's now go back and see what our students, our past students, have to say about school in general. Did they enjoy their time at school? Well, let's see what they have to say. I suppose it was you had to do it, so you went through it. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it at all. I endure is probably the better description. I went with the flow, did what I was asked, and uh, uh, didn't do any more really, just the bare essentials when it came to doing work and homework, but enough to get through without anybody complaining. Um, in hindsight, <laughs> and knowing what a few years later, I you should have put a lot more effort into it, and I might, might have achieved more, more from it. Well, I can't say that I either enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it. It was like the curate said, it was uh, 
good and bad in parts. Um, there was certainly quite an amount of bullying that went on in the section and the set that I, I was with, which somewhat put a downer on school. Um, and there were certain teachers that uh, you either got on with them or you didn't. Quite frequently it was focused on whether you were any good at sport or not. Um, I certainly remember maths and to a certain extent English was not getting on with the teachers because I wasn't a sports guy. My days at school initially, I didn't particularly enjoy it. Um, I enjoy it always as I do with most jobs I have or most aspects of my life was the social stuff. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed the, I was a bit of, the, a, bit of a class clown and I enjoyed the attention and making people laugh and all the rest of it. But there was quite a strict regime at the school. So, um, did I did I um, embrace it? No, it was something I had to do. They were. It was a very strict school, so I basically got on with it. It was not a barrel of laughs for me. Uh, I don't think I would say I enjoyed it. I enjoyed some aspects of it. I enjoyed some particular subjects. Others I struggled with, and therefore I didn't really enjoy it. I enjoyed history, uh, geography to a certain extent, um, arts and woodwork and that sort of things. Um, as I said, I didn't particularly like maths. English I was okay with, and I wasn't particularly sporty, so I didn't really uh, enjoy the endless, long cross-country running that the school would insist on because it made men of us. And rugby, I was a little... <laughs> on the light side for rugby so really I didn't uh, I didn't enjoy that side but um, I'd say yes about 50% of the time I was being taught I enjoyed the other was just not particularly enjoyable um, yeah there was a tremendous amount of homework um, but enjoyed recreational activities included swimming in the outdoor pool which we used to use at lunch times and after school <laughs> yeah, but I think I enjoyed the, the, the social side more. Um, I think being at, um, at the grammar school, pupils were expected to have higher expectations, pressurised to do well, um, with no additional support offered either, as, as I remember. Um, do you remember we had um, Latin was a mandated yes. subject? We had to do it in year one. Mm. Do you remember? Yeah, I did. Latin. So did we enjoy that? Mm, not particularly. <laughs> How did I get on with schooling? Well ups and downs really the first at least first two years maybe uh, two and a half years were pretty dire actually and I found it very hard um, to make friends and mainly because most of my friends from uh, primary school actually hadn't gone to Bennett's End after or during the third year things turned around for me and I kind of started to enjoy school. I made some really really good friends and that helped matters. Um, but yeah, secondary modern education or schools at that time were or could be quite severe and um, but I got through it. How do activities from the past compare with today? We're going to look at the trips that children went on way, way back in the 50s and 60s and compare with what the school does now. And you'll be surprised to see that many of the things that uh, activities that go on inside the school and outside the school are the same today as they were way, way back then. So let's take a look. Sport has always been important to the school right from the beginning when the schools opened right up to now the present day. In this picture you can see the netball teams from the past in 1958 and the present day. Although the fashion may have changed the concept is the same. And again in this picture we have the school football team in 1958 and the present day. Sports in Longdean and the two older schools have always been prevalent and a mixture of different sports have always been played. Of course with football the current day takes into consideration girls football as well. 
Of course, it's always been difficult to find images or photographs of sports way, way back in the 50s and 60s. Not many pictures were taken, but here we see um, two ladies that were from the past schools and achieved county standard and to the right of course games day so in the day yes we we still had games day in both bennett's end and actually grammar school as we do today on the left hand side we see a very old picture from the early 60s a late district trip for the sixth form and and to the right we have a more recent picture of a duke of edinburgh awards trip well where would we be without the school play and school plays have always been the four of entertainment um, during the calendar year the picture on the left shows a play from 63 called the magistrate and to the right we have a Christmas themed Snow White presentation from 2017. Presentation and prize giving within the schools has always been performed on an annual basis. The picture on the left shows uh, the presentations of books being given and on the right hand side a more recent picture of awards and cups being given to students. And of course, where would we be without the annual trip to Ivanhoe Beacon? On the left-hand side, you can see a very old picture of children from probably Apsley Grammar School. And this details Ivanhoe Beacon clearly. And on the right-hand side, of course, a more recent picture of the same or similar activities still taking place. So... We can see that activities from the past still are reflected in today's society or today's school life. Well, so I distinctly remember the slipper and a, a run up in the, uh, in the in in the changing rooms uh, from one particular guy. And that will stick in my mind forever. I don't recall ever having had the cane. I'm pretty sure I didn't. Um, that was administered fairly lightly. But uh, do remember in the uh, in the queue either to see the deputy head, usually him, or occasionally the head, uh, for the odd misdemeanour here or there. The ruler on the back of the hand. And uh, the inevitable blackboard board rubber thrown at you if you'd uh, got a lapse of concentration. Goodness, it's gone. Well, it was the time back in the 60s and 70s when it was all crash bang wallop and people could actually uh, cane you and slipper you and do, beat you up, all accounts. Funnily enough, it never really happened to me, perhaps because I was such an uh, innocent good boy, but I do recall a few odd occasions when even the innocent good boys, it seems to fall foul, usually in my case, not paying attention. As I must admit, I did tend to drift off, so I did have to write a few lines on occasion, so I recall. I remember French class uh, when my mispronunciations got in the teacher's uh, wick and uh, she made me ha stick in my hand and she whacked it with the ruler a few times, which I thought was very harsh. Uh, well, some were a little brutal. Um, in, in today's society, they wouldn't be acceptable at all. Uh, it was not only physical, which um, I... Uh, I wasn't as bad as some, but I did receive some corporal punishment over the years. Um, psychological punishment I think was something different um, I was on one or two occasions actually made to almost reduced to tears by certain teachers being sarcastic or picking on me or picking on some particular I don't know that I was too skinny or my hair was too long that sort of thing which is really not necessary um, other teachers I think were absolutely fantastic and they would even if you did something wrong they would talk to you and explain why they they were having to punish you because you stepped out of line but i really don't think i think the punishment of those days was just abhorrent and certainly not not um, in today's society it wouldn't be accepted okay. punishment punishment in school was was quite severe um we used to use this thing called green paper where there are lists of school rules and lists of codes of conduct. The codes of conduct were much shorter than school rules. So 
if you were talking in club or whatever you did in club, you could get four codes of conduct. That means you need to write down the codes of conduct, which the code the conduct of the pupils, um, four times or six times. If you didn't do them, you, they would double it. If you did something slightly more, they would give you school rules. And school rules was an A4 page of the rules of the school. And to write one out would take you 30, 45 minutes. And you could be given four school rules for nothing. And that would take you three or four hours to do it. So that was one aspect of, of punishment. The other one was detention, but they had to by law give 24 hours, which they did. And the other thing was cane. Caning was normal. Um, I was lucky that I didn't get the cane, but there were many children that did. So yes, um, punishments were quite severe in, in my view in those days. What about yeah. you? Yeah, I remember the, I think it was the cane by Mr Wrigley for the boys and the slipper or plimsoll by Miss Adams who was the, the deputy head, but she yeah. was like over for the females, mm. wasn't she? Um, the form teacher, Mr Fanu, um, would also throw the board rubber mainly at the boys for misbehaving. I bet, I mean, when I'm saying throwing, I mean chucking it really hard. It actually hit, was it Adrian McCall? Somebody? Probably, yeah. Yeah, so. actually on the above his eye, it just missed his eye. Mm. What were the punishments like? Well, yes, the headmaster certainly had a cane and he did use it at times that was for sure um, but it was only done sparingly i think and it was really just a last resort what was quite evident was the uh, as i've mentioned the games teachers would use the slipper and they would use it quite often um, you would get the slipper if you had forgotten your games kit or you were just late turning up or any other reason really you weren't trying hard at games maybe you would get the slipper or you wouldn't go into the showers afterwards that was another one and when you got the slipper you got it in front of your classmates so a, a double humiliation there really we are now going to talk to mike kitchener both pupil teacher and archivist at longdean school Mike has the almost unique situation where he attended Apsley Grammar School in the 1950s, left for university and then came back to the school as a teacher. He's spent almost his whole life at Longdean School. So let's now get an insight into Mike's incredible journey at the school. Mike, um, my first question to you is about obviously actually grammar school yeah. and can you remember your first day? The top group was in the fourth year Yeah. and there weren't many of them, 30 kids in that year, something like that. And Wrigley was there then as head Wrigley master. was head teacher and there was a handful of teachers, there weren't many teachers. Um, can you remember what it was like to actually go on that first day and yeah. what it was yeah. Like entering that school, was yeah. it quite foreboding? No, no, the, the, by and large the, the kids were very friendly and accommodating because it was a very small school, you know, they were interested to know who you were, you know, where you came from and uh, um, what your interests were and you could, you established a small cohort of people in your year, in your form group, you know, that you made friends with in the first few days um, and it was comfortable because it was so small I don't know how many 120 kids something like that so I guess when when you fight you you reached the sixth form at what some point there yes and and then the skill, school had, had filled up I guess absolutely yeah and was quite yeah, large 1300 yeah. yes 1400 so I saw it grow from a handful of kids about what 200 kids in the first Yes. Yeah. So when you left, the school had filled up. Yeah. And you left in the upper sixth, or yeah, I had two. I had three years in the sixth form. And then you went to university. Yes, I did. Yeah. Oh. I was lucky enough to get 
uh, a definite place. At, on the basis of my A-levels, I got three A-levels. Um, my outstanding A-level was art and, and my career through school was excelling in art and sport, really. I went down to see my old art teacher, Frank Moore, uh, at Apsley Grammar School and we discussed you know, what I was doing and he said well if you're interested he said we've got a job going here he said we've got applicants but they're not very strong he said so if you're interested there's a post here for you on the staff as an assistant art teacher so I joined the school as an assistant and then after some years I forget how many years it was now Frank Moore said to me I've got something of interest to you he said I'm going to take retirement he said and the head of the head of art is open for grabs he said um, we've got we've got applicants but they don't look very strong he said so if you're interested the job's yours so I took over from him but you I, I guess were you just well you weren't just confined to art were you no. you, you were very heavily into sport yes uh, both as a, yes. a student and yeah. then competitive and then <laughs> as representing, a teacher. representing the school through my all my years of virtually everything yes you know there wasn't any sport that you no wouldn't undertake. No, that's right. And Roy Parslow was a was a, a, a player in the first 15 at Camelot and he encouraged us boys to go down and play and I managed to get myself in the under 16 team down there, um, the Colts team, and I played right the way through until when I was about 17 and a half I had a very bad accident and broke my nose uh, it was a scrummage and somebody came up underneath and hit me with their head right on the bridge of my nose and I had to go, I couldn't play rugby anymore and I had to go into hospital to have it straightened but I played basketball and I became school captain of basketball and we won everything. We also played in a district league of um, uh, all the factories had teams Mar Post was the post office, Rota, Rotax had a team, um, all the schools, Ashlands had a team, Cavendish had a team, and we won it every year by a distance. You know. So are you saying that Bennett's End, my, my passion, my school that I yeah. went to, yeah. uh, wasn't uh, able to achieve any... No, they were good at basketball, well, we could always beat them. Yes, OK. Yeah. Because... Um, what was his name, the PE teacher? A Nesbitt. Nesbitt, yeah, because Nesbitt was a keen basketball coach and he had a good team, good team. And if anybody ran as close, it was Bennett's end, but we would always beat them. <laughs> <laughs> so when you returned as a teacher, you you taught basketball, yes, is that right? Yes, I did, yeah. Any other sport? Um, not really. Not really. No. So you, 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 that was your passion. Basketball, basketball. was my f forte. Okay. Yeah. So it was art and ba basketball, yeah, basically. Art and basketball, yeah. And, yeah. and general studies, yeah. I think. When the, the two schools amalgamated, actually Grammar School and Bennett's End, yeah. uh, you were there teaching. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what were your views then of uh, the two schools amalgamating? Were you in favour of that? Well, there wasn't. There wasn't. An op Nobody, we didn't have a view, it was a, it was a fait accompli, see what I mean? So you made the best of, if you considered it to be a bad job, and it wasn't really because there were some good kids at Bennett's End, and some of them took the opportunity to flourish. You know, the competition with better kids and teachers who were by and large more academic and more, they pushed the kids more, and a lot of them did very well. You know. With the, with the amalgamation, they rose to the challenge. Yes. You know, I think it was beneficial to a lot of kids. There was no kind of snobbery involved with, you know, the amalgamation. Not really. There was, there was I think, there was, there was a group of kids that struggled. They were the lower end of the Bennett's End. I could, they were the non-academic from Bennett's End mm. who struggled because Wrigley didn't understand them. So he delegated to Dane, Peter Dane, mm -hmm who was the deputy head, who was head of lower school, who took on the mantle of trying to integrate the lower, the weaker kids 
academically. And some of them made the grade. You know, it was, I think there was a happy school by and large. A few kids, let's say a few kids opted out. So they didn't, they didn't make the grade. You know, but there weren't many. So, what was teaching like for you at, at uh, Long Dean? You were there for quite some time, obviously. Yeah, it, well, it was. I had two strings to my bow. One was teaching the kids and one was exhibiting work around the school. And I would always have an exhibition up and Sue became, my wife Sue became my technician at school, my uh, art exhibition technician. And so we always had artwork around the school and it was stuff that the kids were doing and it was always put up around the school. And then we would have occasionally big exhibitions of outstanding artwork and it was a focal point for the kids to see stuff that was quality and they could aspire to it and if they did it went up you know and that was Sue's, Sue's forte mm. she would help me I would mount it up she would display it we every time there was a parents evening we'd have a big exhibition up and many of the parents would come to me and say you know thank you for showing and we were pleased to see our son or daughter's work up, you know, because they were very proud to see their work displayed and they, they took uh, comfort in knowing that they were achieving. You know. And um, then you saw an opportunity to stay at the school yeah, even further as, yeah, as the archivist. Yeah, because, because I was always collecting stuff from the local newspaper, the Gazette, and the Watford Observer, and uh, the Free Paper, and, and I always I kept a scrapbook of that. I also also kept all the play programmes um, from the drama department, you know, and I also kept all the um, national newspaper cuttings and everything else in a scrapbook. So that became the basis of the archive. You know, that's what's running in through the press all the time. And then you'd add things that the kids were doing into it. So it became a very comprehensive view, a snapshot of what the school was doing. And now we've got this whole oh, snapshot, yeah. haven't we, from the 1950s yeah. right the way yeah. through to present day. You've, you've got a colourful historical record of what the school was doing. And the achievement and, of kids. And probably quite unique, actually, yeah. mm. for any, any school in this well, area. I, th I think it's probably, I mean, schools do. I mean, but generally speaking, state schools don't have a very big archive. And, and what they do doesn't cover the plethora of things that the school is doing all the time. Mm. And I think it, it's unique in that respect. And of course, the school had quite a number of teachers that had were from Oxbridge. Yes, a lot, a lot. You see, Wrigley had uh, a, a link to the employment officers at Oxford and Cambridge University, and one of her, one of his first um, ports of call was to ask them if they'd got any new graduates or graduates coming up who had showed uh, were doing dip eds and showed um, flair in their capabilities in teaching their particular subject, particularly with English and math. So we had a flood of teachers, new teachers coming into the school with Oxbridge graduates, you know, gradu um, degrees to come into those departments with a, um, a knowledge of the, of, of the subject and an interesting education who had managed to keep the standard high. You know. But that's not to say that other departments recruited top class teachers. You know. Right, yeah. thanks Mike yeah. for talking to us today. Yeah. We have talked at length about the two head teachers from the old schools, but of course, when Longdean became a comprehensive and when VJ Wrigley finally stood down in 1993, the school then had a variety of different head teachers over the next 20 years. All of these heads added their own individual style to running Longdean, and some only stayed a very short while. Today, in 2022, we have Graham Cunningham, who joined as deputy head in 2007 and became head teacher in 2012. Let's now talk to Graham and see what his thoughts are on the history and future of Longdean School. So, uh, Graham Cunningham, um, 
in the period you have been head at Long Dean School, what changes have you seen overall? So I think in the time I've been at the school, going back before I became head as deputy in 2007, I think the, the biggest thing I think is you've now got a school that is fulfilling its potential. So when I started as my predecessor's deputy, the real thing that we felt was that the school was a sleeping giant and that there was a real source of untapped potential. And I think the biggest thing in the tenure of my headship and in my time before that is that we've now got more kids achieving their potential. And I think we've done that mainly through true personalisation, that whatever your unique talent or, or gift or skill, um, whether it be knowledge, whether it be sport, whether it be performing, whether it be an interest, we, we've just found a way to accommodate that. And I think that as a result of that, we have students now who are leaving with qualifications but they're also leaving it as more more rounded individuals who can who can make their mark in the world i think some of the other big changes i think are just the the sheer physical size of the school uh, we've grown to being around about 1500 students now we've also really worked hard to improve the facilities you know we when i started in in 2012 as head this was two schools joined as one and it's now one one site with a really good campus that we're trying to utilize for the benefit of the students we've refurbished the sports hall we've got some real sort of state of the art sports pitches we have a a garden that we now make part of our curriculum as well and i think the, the impact of that is that you've now got a school that really sits at the heart of its of its community and that's something that we're we're really really proud of that there is a a good school at the heart of Bennett's End. Other things that have changed I think is probably the 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 demographic that we serve um, you know we we've got about 19 percent of our student population are from ethnic minority backgrounds and traditionally that was Pakistani heritage predominantly but it's now more black African or Afro-Caribbean uh, alongside that Pakistani heritage uh, and white British um, demographic. Okay Graham uh, going forward how do you see the school in another 10 years time from now? So I think in, in 10 years' time, what I'd, I'd like to see is, is a degree of continuity. So I'd like to see that the values that, that we hold dear to about support, challenge, innovation, the inclusivity, the fact that whilst we value qualifications, we also realise that the skills you leave school with and that being a, a good citizen that impacts upon the communities that you are a part of is still central to what the school stands for uh, and I think if if that is still at the heart of what Long Dean is trying to do then the school fundamentally will be in a really really good place. I think probably we also need to be changing to to things that are happening beyond the walls of the school. So education is, is changing, you know, technology is becoming more and more central to it. There is always responding to what you know, government policies, government processes um, talk about. Schools are being asked to do lots more, whether it's around mental health, whether it's around social care, uh, whether it's around health, whether it's around SEN, I think we need to be changing before the change is needed to make sure that we're still you know, remain in that school of choice at, at, at the heart of Bennett's End. Okay, thanks very much Graham for taking part. Well that's the end of the film and I hope you enjoyed watching it. It took about a year in the making and now of course I just need to thank everybody that took part in the film with the help of the Long Dean School's sixth form. So that's bye from me for now. Bye.